Good afternoon and welcome to our New York Archives Magazine online speaker series. I'm Josie Madison, editor of New York Archives. Today, we're joined by Jane Wilcox and Tom Ruller for our program, Researching New York Families, writing the book on state archives records and untold stories. Jane E. Wilcox serves on the New York State Archives Advisory Committee and the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society's New York Family History Advisory Committee. A former NYGNB record editorial board member, Jane speaks at genealogy conferences and institutes. With her company, Forget Me Not Ancestry in Albany, Jane specializes in pre-Civil War New York research. She hosted the Forget Me Not Hour podcast with archives at www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Jane E. Wilcox. She has a master's degree in journalism and a bachelor's degree in history and English literature, as well as an elementary school teacher certification. Thomas J. Reller recently retired from his position as New York State Archivist, a role he has held since 2015. An active professional for 35 years, he is the author of several peer-reviewed journal articles and reviews on the use of technology in archives and the preservation of records in electronic form. Tom has been a consultant for several state governments and other organizations, focusing on electronic records management and preservation. He remains actively engaged as a board member and steward of the Archives Partnership Trust. For those of you who have joined us today, welcome. We're happy that you're here. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so you can feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll set aside some time at the end to get to as many of those as we can. And now I am pleased to introduce Jane Wilcox and Tom Roller. Thank you very much, Josie. And hello, Jane. It is always, always a great pleasure to see you. The Even pleasure is always mine. <laughs> <laughs> Even virtually. I think today's program is going to be really informative. Of course it is. And, and I think what I appreciate about this, maybe not the most, but one of the things I appreciate about this conversation that we're about to have is the perspective that you have on our collection here at the State Archives. And we, you know, we live with these records every day and we work with these records all the time. You have as much knowledge about our collection, I think, as anyone on the staff just about. And I think, but you come at it from a totally different perspective. And I'm really excited about having this conversation today to learn more about your perspective. I'm excited to be here and share share this perspective. <gasps> good, good. Well, let's start off with the, the first question that I have for you. Um, and it's about uh, this forthcoming book that, that you are the author of. I understand that the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society is actively working with the State Archives on finalizing the publication of the New York State Archives, a guide for family historians, biographers, and historical research. While this publication is being finalized and some of the work is continuing, can you describe the book I certainly can describe the book. I'm going to start with the uh, list of the chapters, and it's it's going to be, I think, mind blowing for some people who aren't aware what all is at the state archives. Uh, so these are, are the chapters: uh, appointments and elected officials, British colonial records, canal records, census records, citizenship, which includes alien registrations and naturalizations. Uh, court records, uh, the major ones being the Court of Chancery and the Supreme Court of Judicature, Dutch colonial records, educational records, and a lot of these concern the state normal schools and uh, certified teachers. Also financial records from the state's treasurer and comptroller, indigenous people, institutional, which would include poor houses and uh, schools for people uh, who have disabilities, uh, blind and deaf. Um, we have three big sections for land, uh, uh, patents and deeds, mortgages and mortgage foreclosures, and taxes and tax sales. Then there's the legislation chapter that includes statutes and petitions uh, to the state legislature. Um, a loyalist chapter for, for those uh, loyalists who were here during the American Revolution. A military chapter is big. Uh, it goes from the French and Indian War in the colonial times to 
peacetime in the 20th century with the New York National Guard. Then there's the miscellaneous chapter uh, that has the governor's correspondence, photographic and cartographic sections, occupational. Uh, so this concerns state employees and some licenses uh, that the state archives has. Uh, the penal chapter, prisons, reformatories and pardons uh, and uh, probate, which most genealogists are aware of, but may not be familiar with, with what's at the state archives. And then the last chapter is the vital records, and that includes marital actions like divorces, annulments, and separations. So that's, that's, those are the chapters. That's the bulk of the book. So within each chapter, there is an overview uh, that tells what's in the chapter. Then there's a historical background that sets the stage for the records, because these records have history. It tells uh, it, just very briefly why these records were created. And then the bulk of the chapter, the records themselves. And so within this section, uh, we have uh, put the record series in tables. And the record series is how the archives has uh, uh, cataloged each of the, the different types of records and within the records then in series. Um, so the tables have the title, it has the uh, date span of the records, we have also noted if there are any indexes. Uh, and so the archives has a name index online at its website, that's included. Um, some indexes are internal, so the volumes uh, have indexes within them. We, I think we have like 10 different types of indexing uh, systems that the archives has, and they're noted in the tables for, for whatever we could find. The tables also have the volume and cubic feet of the series so that you know if the series is really large uh, or if it's just small, if it just has a handful of records. We've also noted if uh, the records have been filmed uh, so that you can get them on film at the archives or in some cases you can get records through interlibrary loan and, um, and that is noted. Uh, and then the other thing that we've included in the uh, tables is access restrictions. Uh, and so there are certain uh, records that are, are restricted because of privacy laws uh, and, and other reasons. Then within each chapter, I have spotlighted a few of the records. So I have uh, selected one type, one, one specific document that illustrates a certain series. And so I'm focusing on that particular document and what it means. Uh, so uh, I may refer to a law. I may, I may describe what's happening in that, that record. And so uh, this gives you a sense for what the, the uh, records in the series are like and within that particular chapter. I've also included some examples in the spotlights of some really small gems that the State Archives has. And this was, you know, wow, look at this record. You know, I, I need to show people uh, what this record is all about. Um, so I have uh, included a generous sampling of more than 6,000 um, series at, that are at the State Archives. So, so the Archives has, has about 6,000 series, and I've haven't looked at all of them, but it seems like I looked at all of them. Um, so it's, it's a generous sampling. Wow, I, I think only one word comes to mind, encyclopedic. <laughs> this is uh, just uh, fa fantastic, fantastic. Jane, why do you think such a book is needed? Well, the short answer is because most researchers don't realize what can be discovered at the State Archives. Um, I know I didn't. The long answer, is uh, I think it's I think this all started uh, with Aaron Goodwin's book on the records of the New York City Municipal Archives, which the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society published a few years ago. Uh, and so I wasn't in the room when where it happened, but my understanding is that the uh, uh, GNB and the State Archives got together and said, "Hey, let's do something similar for the State Archives records." And I want to uh, share a slide now, also explaining why we are, why we think this book is needed. Um, so, 
there we are. Um, so for those of you who have not been to the State Archives, uh, the Archives is on the 11th floor of the Cultural Education Center. Uh, this is downtown Albany. And uh, it shares space with the New York State Library's manuscripts and special collections. On the seventh floor is the New York State Library. And then on the bottom floor is the New York State Museum. So people get confused about what records are held by the different entities there. Um, so uh, I'm, many of you may already know this uh, for those of you who are uh, frequent listeners to the speaker series, but the State Archives has the colonial and state governmental records. Uh, so that's for the executive, uh, legislative, and judicial branches of government. So governmental records. The library, on the other hand, has personal and family papers, correspondence, business papers, churches. So those are the manuscripts and special collections. And the archives and manuscripts share the, the same floor. So they're both on the 11th floor, but there is a distinction between the types of records that each holds. And then museum, uh, it has the artifacts. Uh, so as a professional genealogist, I use the archives routinely routinely with my own research and with my client research. But when I started doing the research for the book, my eyes opened wide. I had no idea what the state archives has for genealogists. And now I do. And now with this book, the family historians, biographers, and historical researchers are going to know too. So this is why the book is needed. Wonderful. It's amazing to me how many people don't either A, know we have a state archives, and if they do, they don't know that it really belongs to them. Now, these are the people's records, and access to the archives is free. Uh, there's no fee to do it. Um, it's not restricted. Anyone can sign in and any uh, uh, legitimate, re I'll say legitimate researcher, you provide some kind of a photo ID to come in and do, do research. But people are often intimidated, and I'm hoping that when this book uh, is, is published, um, it does help people understand better what their public resource is and how they can access it. it you talked a little bit about the State Archives has government records. Can you talk a little bit more about what some of the typical records at, that the State Archives preserves are? I can. Uh, so I mentioned, it, well, the chapters, you know, that we have have all of those chapters, but in, in particular, um, some of the larger uh, collections for uh, researchers, probate uh, for the colonial and early state period. Um, military, as I mentioned, starts with the French and Indian War, and uh, the actual uh, wartime records go to World War I, but then there are the peacetime records for the uh, New York National Guard. Uh, also at the State Archives, New York State censuses, and those uh, that the archives now has are from the 20th century. Prison records, reformatory records, uh, also the colonial uh, Dutch and British governments. Uh, so uh, we're, we're talking about the governors, and uh, for the, the uh, Dutch, it was the director general, uh, and the, the councils and the uh, legislature. So those types of records the uh, State Archives has. Um, the, the archives also has patents and deeds, and then um, we have all of the state level courts. Um, so th those are the major uh, collections at the New York State Archives. And it, it just sounds like it's things that the, anything the government did, and again, the state archives has records going back to the 1630s, the Dutch records uh, through the, the present day, anything the government did that might have interacted with people somehow uh, those records, many of those records wind up being preserved. Of the, of the things that, that the State Archives preserves and makes available, what are some records that are of particular value to genealogists? Well, this may come as a surprise for a lot of researchers. For, from the, a genealogist's perspective, any record that gives a person's name, a specific location, and a date is valuable, can be valuable for genealogy research. And sometimes if a date is missing or a location is missing and we can infer it from records surrounding it, that can also be valuable uh, for genealogists. 
So when I explain uh, genealogy research to people who, who don't do it, I say I'm looking for people with their feet on the ground. And that's the focus that I took with the book. Uh, I was looking for what types of records at the state archives will do that. So for genealogy, many people think we're looking just for names, births, marriages, death dates, and places. That's just the skeleton. We want to put flesh on the bones. And so we're looking for biography, and we want to tell our ancestors stories. We also want to place our ancestors in their historical context. Uh, so knowing the historical context of the records is also going to help us place our ancestors in their own historical context. There's more as we get more experienced. Many of us, all of us actually, have brick walls in our own lineages, and we're stumped when the typical records haven't given us answers uh, to our questions. So for instance, we're looking for clues uh, for a specific uh, person who we don't know the mother or father's name uh, or you know where they were from. So we're trying to answer that question. Who is the father? Who is the mother? There may be another specific question that we want to answer about a person. So this is where the, I think the fun really comes in with genealogy research. We're detectives. We're trying to answer questions about a person and we're putting the pieces of the puzzle together. We're analyzing the data that we find in all of these, these records. And then we're drawing conclusions and we're trying to answer specific questions about our ancestors. Now, a lot of people who work with the archival records and who may not uh, do genealogy themselves. Um, so archivists, librarians, municipal historians, academic historians, for, for example, they may not realize that this is how genealogists do research. And the book is going to help them as well, uh, the librarians, the archivists, municipal historians, and the academic historians. Um, so it's a it's a win 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 all around for for everybody I think, and actually let me give you a couple of ex examples. Um, so this is uh, uh, what we call doing cluster research. Uh, so for ex for example, if uh, we're looking uh, at Mark Blakely, uh, we're researching him, and I found him in this record. It's called Special Bail Pieces. I'm, I have a date, January 9th, 1830, um, and it's the, in the January uh, 1830 term, term of the Supreme Court of Judicature. Uh, this is the bail for Mark Blakely. He's a defendant in the case. And this was filed at the Geneva office, so out in Western New York. Mark's bail was Daniel Trowbridge. Uh, Daniel is a Cooper, and he was from Phelps, Ontario County. So Daniel is the surety that Mark is going to appear in court. Usually with, with the sureties, with these bails, um, the people who are, are um, the surety are probably a good friend or a family member. So in researching for Mark, I'm also interested in Daniel um, because I've got where Daniel was living. I've got the specific date. I know Daniel's a cooper. And so I know that Daniel has an association with Mark. Phelps, Ontario County, 1830. This is called cluster research. And uh, we're looking at the family, neighbors, associates, and friends of the person that we're researching. And it, this is very important for New York research during this time. Vital records were not kept in the state in general until 1880. And so prior to 1880, we need to use this cluster research. And the records at the state archives are going to help us with that. Um, another example. Um, this is uh, a, an example I did or a research I did for a client. Um, and this is feet on the ground. So I needed to prove that Nicholas Storm Sr. was alive on a certain date during the Revolutionary War. And this was for a DAR application. Part of the process of answering the question of when uh, Nicholas Storm died, was he alive on this certain date, 
I needed to distinguish between him, Nicholas Sr., and his son, Nicholas Jr., two men of the same name. They were both tenants in the Phillipsburg Manor in Westchester County. So in determining uh, if I could distinguish between the two men, I want to show you what I, I did with the state archives records. Um, so I looked at the prerogative court, um, which is colonial uh, probate. Uh, I looked at the state court of probates, uh, which uh, started in 1777. I went through every single probate, every single record of a Phillipsburg Manor tenant that was filed in each of those two courts. I went page by page and I was looking for Nicholas Sr. as a witness, an executor, an administrator, a beneficiary in somebody's estate. No luck with the court records. So then I also, in trying to distinguish between the two men, uh, at the State Archives, I found this list of certificates uh, of payments made by the treasurer. And this is Nicholas Jr. Notice there's no junior not noted by his name. That's the problem with Westchester County. Junior and senior were often not used. Um, so he's receiving payment uh, for his militia service. Uh, he was in the 4th Westchester uh, Militia Company. Another series that I used, um, this one, this is also a Revolutionary War payment, Nicholas uh, Jr. Uh, actually signing this record that he is receiving his pay. That was really exciting, seeing his signature on this record. Another uh, series that I used, um, these are records uh, that the State Archives had or has, and uh, they were transcribed by the War Department in the 1890s, uh, and it includes some of the Revolutionary War records. Um, you're going to find all about uh, this, uh, uh, these records that you, the U.S. War Department uh, transcribed in the book. Um, these are now digitized on Family Search. Uh, so this is where I found this record. And I found Nicholas in March 1782 making a forage claim. His hay had been requisitioned by the Continental Army while they were in Westchester County. And he wanted some payment for the hay that the Army took. Another record that I used uh, was the 1779 tax assessments on real and personal property. Uh, this was done in March of 1779. I did not find Nicholas on the list. That's probably because he was exempt, as noted in the law. And then finally, uh, another uh, series that kind of pointed to the State Archives, or actually two records that pointed to the State Archives. I found these uh, two published petitions, and they were signed by the Phillipsburg Manor tenants. I wanted to see if either of these petitions had anyone who signed with an X mark. We know Nicholas Jr. could actually sign his name. If Nicholas Sr. had signed with an X mark, or if Nicholas in either of these petitions had signed with an X mark, then likely that man was Nicholas Sr. But the transcribers for both of these petitions did not include an X mark for those who used their marks. So then I went looking for the original petitions. Um, these were submitted to the state legislature. Um, they would be at the state archives, but it appears that they were destroyed or damaged in the 1911 Capitol fire. So uh, these are just two examples of how genealogists research their ancestors. We are looking for people with their feet on the ground. Jean, you just mentioned this 1911 Capitol fire. Can you talk a little bit more about the fire and its impact on the records? Let me show you first. So this is from the uh, colonial British records. So in March of 1911, the state capitol, part of the state capitol burned. And it was the part that had the state library. The state library had been collecting governmental records and other types of records, manuscripts and books for about 90 years. And uh, the library held the governmental records at that time. It was a devastating loss. Especially hard hit were the colonial British and the governor's records, the legislative petitions, Revolutionary War records, 
all of the state censuses through 1911. Um, the surviving records are now at the state archives, not the state library. So the archives has the governmental records. And here's another, another example, even, even worse than that one. Um, I do want to point out uh, that the archives online finding aids uh, for the particular series that went through the fire will note if there is fire damage. This wasn't something that you and I had talked about too much beforehand, Jane, but I know that they, there was an effort prior to the fire uh, to publish some of the colonial records. Are they good resources, these published books, uh, particularly about the Revolutionary War and the early colonial period? Are they good resources for genealogists? Thank, thank you for answering that question or asking that question. Um, so, yes, uh, for the most part, they are. Uh, they, uh, uh, the the uh, state archivist, uh, O'Callaghan, uh, is one example. He looked at the records before they went through the fire. Um, a, a few people looked at the records before the fire. They made transcriptions, they made abstracts, in some cases they made, made calendars with just a very brief description. In the book, I have noted many of these, what we would call substitutes for the original records. So they are very valuable for researchers. Um, I'll, I'll add, the State Archives in our research room has copies of many of those published, if not all of those published books, which include um, the records of George Clinton up to a certain point, um, many of the rosters of Revolutionary War soldiers, et cetera. Um, and just to also follow up on another question that you, you raise with me is the availability of some of these resources online. Um, I know that uh, the State Archives has a relationship with both family search and with ancestry. Um, are, are those in your book, do you talk about what might or might or might not be available through those resources? We do. Um, okay. So in in the tables, we note if the series has been digitized uh, and we give the ancestry collection number. Um, and I believe there's going to be a, an appendix uh, that includes what family search has. Um, and in, in some cases, well, in, in most cases with Ancestry, that's the index uh, for the series. Mm -hmm. um, and then Family Search, mostly browsable. Um, but yes, we have noted that, as well as the collections that the State Archives has digitized and that they have on, on the website. Great. Thank you. And, and just a shameless plug for the State Archives. <laughs> if you go to the website, there's a link right on the homepage about access, accessing Ancestry.com and the resources that we've made available uh, through that resource for free uh, to New York State residents. And, uh, and I will also put a plug in, in our research room here in Albany, um, we are an affiliate of Family Search, and you have the ability to go online, uh, again, without having to pay, um, through the computer that we have up in our research room to access family search. But now I'm done with my shameless plug, <laughs> or at least that shameless plug. So throughout all this work that you've been doing, um, you've made some very interesting discoveries uh, when doing the research for the book. Can you talk a little bit about just a couple of the discoveries that you made that are especially exciting to you? I, I can because there are actually too many to tell you. Um, you're going to have to look at the book <laughs> to, <laughs> to look at them, uh, but I, I do have a, a, a few uh, to share. Um, one, I, I mentioned that the State Archives has deeds, uh, and one series of deeds many researchers are not aware exist. Um, so usually when we're researching uh, for deeds, we go to the county clerks. Uh, we go to the county uh registers of deeds to look for private individual to private in individual. The state archives has some of those. And these are deeds that were recorded by the provincial secretary uh, during the colonial period, and then the secretary of state during the state period. Um, and then they're in series A0453. Um, so again, these are different from what the, the uh, county clerks have. Um, this example uh, on the slide is from Staten Island in 1678. 
Um, so just making pe people aware of this is the type of one of the types of deeds that the state archives has. This next uh, two are probably the biggest discoveries that I made while I was researching the book. These are mortgages. Again, we go uh, to the county clerk and we look for the mortgages there, um, which are in, uh, in New York, they're separate from the deeds in the county clerk's offices. The State Archives has two types of mortgages. This one uh, that you see on this slide, this is a state funded mortgage. And this is with the state having surplus money and they are encouraging settlement and development of improved land. They're also receiving some revenue from the, uh, the, uh, um, the interest that was due on the loan. These loans uh, for the state funded mortgages were administered through appointed county loan commissioners, but the state kept records too. Um, it has an accounting of the payments on the loans, like we see here. Um, this person, uh, what he owed is on the left, and then his payments are on the right. And these are from the state comptroller's records. Now, the second type of mortgage uh, that the state held was the sale of unappropriated state land. So the state owns some land. Uh, it's not appropriated for any purpose. And the state decided we're going to raise some money um, and sell the land at auction. And then the state held mortgages on these loan on, on these uh, loans. And uh, people with these loans made payments directly to the state. Um, so here's an example of Josiah Cook. Uh, he's got uh, land in the New Petersburg tract, uh, which was in Madison and Oneida, and Oneida counties. And on the left, his uh, payments that are, are due, on the right, payments that were made. If you look on the right, you're going to see E. Cook and Joseph Cook making payments on Josiah's loans. So if we're having trouble researching Josiah, here are two leads to follow. So this is using the cluster research by also researching E. Cook and Joseph Cook. Um, another uh, record that I, it's like, wow, <laughs> the State Archives has this. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that uh, slavery existed in the uh, colony and, and state of New York. And so the state passed a law in 1799 uh, that uh, was providing for gradual emancipation. The actual date had not been set in 1799. Um, but part of this process was uh, children born to enslaved women had to be registered at birth starting July 4th, 1799. Under the law, uh, these children could be, quote, abandoned um, by their mother's enslaver. And then the state would pay for maintenance uh, through the local overseers of the poor. Often the child stayed with her mother um, but the enslaver went to the state and said, we're abandoning, and then was able to get the maintenance uh, through the state. Um, some of these accounting records were submitted to the state and uh, have survived. It gives the name of the child, uh, the mother's master, the term of the time, a birth date, and then how much was paid for her maintenance. And these have been digitized, uh, and they are on the State Archives website. Um, another uh, big series that is like, wow, look at all of these records here. Um, this is accounts audited, uh, and it concerns the War of 1812. And these are payments that the state had to make. This example on the slide, uh, these are American POWs from Ontario and Genesee uh, counties and payments. There are 10 pages of the so-called Niagara sufferers. These are refugees from the British uh, burning of Buffalo in 1813, and they're receiving mortgage loans from the state to rebuild. And then in this series, we also have soldiers making claims for back pay, also their widows making claims for their deceased husband's pay. So we may find a death and then the name of a widow through, uh, through these records for War of 1812. And for a court record, an example, um, the Court of Chancery uh, handled guardianships for minor heirs. 
uh, starting in the colonial period, and then it went uh, to 1847 when the court was abolished. Uh, the case files for these guardianships have wonderful information about families of deceased individuals. This is an example from 1834. The widow is petitioning the Chancery Court to sell real estate. We get in her petition the names and ages of her children uh, with her deceased husband. We also, in the petition, get the name of the um, grandparents of the grandchildren and aunts and uncles because the grandfather's estate was also involved uh, in this uh, guardianship case. The state has some licenses, um, but not as many as you might expect. I think this is a really wonderful set, and it's the midwife licenses. And these are from the um, State Department of Health. They start in 1914. Uh, with each uh, person's entry, uh, we get languages that she spoke and where she was trained to be a midwife. There's also the little known military records. I, I've mentioned them, the New York National Guard during peacetime. They mustered periodically for inspection, training, and other persons, our purposes, and attendance was taken. Um, so this is a muster roll for the New York Naval Militia, uh, March of 1951. And we have the 3-81st Division mustering on the ship USS Prairie State. The ship was docked at Pier 73 in New York City. And we get the names of 111 crew members, two officers and 109 enlisted men. Enlisted men. And then an example of one of the small gems at the State Archives. Uh, this is a unique set of records uh, created by a prison. Uh, this is uh, daily reports of monies received by incarcerated individuals at Auburn Prison in Cuga County. Uh, and here we have on March 2nd, 1908, 11 receiving money totaled, uh, totaling $20.80. So we get the names of the incarcerated individuals, and we get the names of the friends and family who are sending them money. Um, so this is uh, just a few of the examples of the discoveries that I made in these records that can be valuable to genealogists. And there are places that you wouldn't normally look. There are financial records of the state governments. Uh, or or prison records or license files. It's pretty it's pretty amazing. It is. What's also amazing, I'm looking at this slide and I just see names and names and names. This genealogy is about people and you've met a lot of people. When I say met, you virtually met them because they're long uh, since gone. But you've met a lot of people in doing the research for your book. Are there any stories, notable stories, about individuals that you've encountered that you'd be interested in sharing with us? I, I have a few. Uh, so here's one, meeting Alexander Banter. Uh, he uh, lives on City Island, which is now Bronx County. He was 20 years old, and he was being bound out to be an apprentice, uh, to be a Hellgate pilot. Now, Hellgate is uh, that part of the East River uh, in New York City that is really hard to navigate. Uh, the waters are, are pretty uh, hazardous. Uh, so to be bound out, he needed the consent of his mother. Uh, so we have his mother's name, Mary Banter. Uh, she's also living at City Island. And uh, Alexander is being bound to Charles F. S. Weaver. Um, he also lives in Westchester County. He's uh, from the town of Pelham. And uh, Alexander is learning the art, trade, and mystery of navigation as a pilot, hand, and seaman. And he is uh, signing up for three years on board the Sloop Two Brothers. Uh, so this is an example of an indenture uh, that the State Archives has. Um, in 1943, the state uh, took stock of its nursing pool. Um, this is to help the war efforts for World War II. Um, the state wanted to determine how many of its nursing pool they could send overseas uh, to help with the effort there, and then how many would still be on the home front helping uh, with the state's hospitals. And with this record, I met Phyllis Anderson. 
And it says that she was a, a resident at Harlem Hospital in New York City. She was employed at Harlem Hospital in the, uh, as an OR nurse. Uh, Phyllis was born in 1921. She's single and had no children. Um, the, the, it's commonly called the nurse census. And uh, so the, um, uh, the people who were taking stock uh, decided that Phyllis was in an essential position, an OR nurse. Um, it also says that she was going to the teacher's college in the evening and that she was full, uh, employed full-time at the hospital. Um, here we have Lillian Pierce um, in 1913. She is a student at the Thomas Indian School. Uh, this is on the uh, Cattaraugus uh, Reservation in Irving. Um, and in February of 1913, she had a writing assignment. Um, the kids were directed to write to the superintendent of the school. So she writes, Dear Mr. Hill, I am in the sixth grade. My brother and I go to Sunday school every Sabbath. We have been five Sundays so far. We go to the Episcopal Church, which is near Irving. We are having very disagreeable weather. It rained last night and snowed this morning. I think this will be all from your friend, Lillian W. Pierce. Peddler's licenses were issued by the state starting in, in 1804, and the fees varied uh, depending on whether the peddler traveled by foot with a one-horse wagon or a team and a wagon. The state treasurer received the payment and recorded it in his ledger, and then the license was issued by the Secretary of State. So here's the license for Jakob Goldman. Um, this is from April, 1864. This is the register from the Secretary of State. These have been digitized and they are on Ancestry. The license shows that Jakob had a one horse cart. So he was not traveling by foot. Uh, he paid a duty of uh, $30 for one year and a $2 fee. And the State Archives has abstracts of federal records, uh, and these go to uh, from the Civil War to World War I. Uh, and in, the, uh, in this series, we have abstracts of um, the 15th New York Infantry Regiment of the National Guard. It was federalized to participate in World War I. And this is when the, the National Guard was taken federal, federalized and became uh, uh, under the or came under the auspices of the U.S. Army. Um, so when the 15th New York Infantry was federalized, it was redesignated as the 369th Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Army. Uh, this was March of 1918. The 369th was also known as the Harlem Hellfighters. And when they got over to Europe, uh, the white U.S. troops refused to perform combat duty with them. And so eventually the uh, Harlem, Har Harlem Hellfighters were assigned to combat duty with French troops who had no problem working, fighting alongside black men. So here's an abstract for Reginald Bean's service. Uh, when he enlisted, he was age 23. Uh, he was born at Hamilton in the British West Indies. Uh, he enlisted in the New York National Guard on June 5th, 1917. This was two months after the U.S. entered World War I. And then uh, he uh, lived at 114 West 132nd Street in New York City when he enlisted. And then he was demobilized in February 1919. And I found Regi Reginald also living in, uh, in uh, New York City in 1940 in the census. So I did a little extra research on some of these people that I met. Um, here's another example, Benita Suarez. Th this is another eye-opening series, actually. Um, New in New York, aliens, uh, not uh, naturalized citizens, could not own land in New York unless uh, they had legislative approval. Uh, that's a private act through the state legislature. Or starting in 1825, they could take an oath that they had declared their intention to naturalize. Um, and so aliens couldn't own land except for those two, two ways until 1913. I'll add, add the, the stop date. Um, so here's Benita Suarez in 1847. 
she wanted to purchase land. So she appeared before the commissioner of deeds for the city and county of New York to make her deposition, saying that she had declared her intention in the district court of the U.S. for the Southern District of New York. Now, from state and federal laws of the time, I'm, I'm not going to get into them here, we can conclude that Benita was either single or widowed because in 1847, she could not have been purchasing land in her own name as a married woman in New York. And my last person I want to share, uh, this comes from the canal uh, records. So uh, I think most of us know uh, New York has canals and they have ca lots of canal records as well. Uh, so people had uh, uh, damages done uh, by canal construction and other types of things that happened on these canals. And they made claims, uh, damage claims uh, with the state. And so I found this claim for Rebecca M. Ballman, uh, claim number 9698. Uh, this is from 1916. She claimed $830 in damages for her cellar wall, for the upper part of her house, for land that was washed away, and 23 fruit trees in Cohoes near Albany. This is when they were damaged because the east bank of the old Erie Canal washed out. Now for her $830 in damages, she received from the state $325. So these are just a few of the people that I met in the records of the state archives. I just before we leave this slide and for folks who uh, you know, this concept of a record series is an important one. And what I like about the slides that you've shown us is you provide a lot of data about the, the how you identify records in the state archives. So in this particular case, it's B0602 is the series number. Each one of those 6000 plus record series has a unique identifier. And then there's the name of the record series, the Canal Damage Awards. It's a set of records that are filed together and organized together because they're consistent in some particular way. So when we talk about a record series, there's a couple of, there's who created it, but also the unique identifier. And many of my colleagues here in the State Archives never talk about anything other than the numbers. Oh, that particular thing, that's in BO602. Okay, thanks. <laughs> but in any event, it's uh, and you are just about at that level of being <laughs> able to describe these. We only have a couple of more minutes, and I want to make sure we have enough time for the questions that are piling up. So I'm just going to ask you one last question, which really is sort of where would someone who might have hit a brick wall, um, and you talked about that wall, uh, either they're just starting off or they, they're, they're halfway through it, but they can't get past that wall. What would be your best advice for helping them get started or restarted? Oh, thinking, actually, I'm, I'm going to focus on the, the state archives records, uh, so, since that's what we're talking about right now. Um, when you're in that case, you know, you've got a brick wall. You need to think how your ancestors interacted with the provincial or state government of New York. We need to think what their circumstances were. Um, it may be in a sentence, uh, in, in a census, census um, you find them in a poorhouse, uh, so they're indigent. Maybe they were in the military. Maybe one of your ancestors attended Thomas Indian School. They lived near a canal. They worked for a state hospital. Maybe the ancestor was enslaved or a midwife. So thinking about the circ circumstances of your ancestors and then what types of records might have been created uh, under those circumstances. So that's what I hope the book is going to do. I hope the book is going to start people thinking, oh, okay, my ancestor uh, lived near that canal. Oh, I wonder if he uh, you know, made a, a damage claim. With, with the canal. Um, and I do want to show you one example of my own ancestors in the state archives records. So I, I do want to show you can find your ancestors. I actually knew they were there before I started writing the book. 
Um, so here's Jabez and some Samuel Patchen, uh, their father and son. Uh, they were in uh, what's now Saratoga County near Walston Spa. Um, they, during the Revolutionary War, they were in the uh, 12th Albany Militia. They were taken prisoners um, by uh, British and Native Americans in, in separate raids. And then they were imprisoned near Montreal. In 18, uh, or sorry, 1784, the state gave them and their fellow POWs back pay for the time that they spent as POWs. Um, I do want to point out the series has been digitized by the state archives, and the series has been indexed uh, by the state archives with its name index on its website. Very good. Very good advice. I see we've got quite a few questions piling up. Josie, I think it might be a good opportunity for us to start to answer some of those questions. Yes, lots, before lots. We, before we go, Jane, this has been fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank and thank you. you. Thank you. I have, I have a whole list of people that I want to thank, but that, that will be saved mm -hmm. for the book. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Okay, so we have lots of questions. Um, so much information covered, um, but I think the first question is, how can we find out more about the records? Um, two ways, through the book, uh, and, and that will be one of your best resources. The other way is to go to the um, archives online finding aid. That was my best friend when I was doing research on the book. Um, I was able to put in keywords and it searches the entire New York State Archives database. It, it searches through the titles, it th searches through the descriptions, and you can put in keywords. Um, so you can put in the keyword deeds. You can put in the uh, uh, name of a town. Um, uh, you can put in all, like for licensing, if you wanted to find out uh, what licenses the State Archives ha has, you can put in um, the uh, the term licensing under access term. So many different ways that you can search uh, through the finding aid and then look at all of the series that the, the archives has regarding that particular word or topic. Great. So I did just put the link to that finding aid um, into the chat. So anybody who would like that link, it should be there for you. And Tom has also pulled it up on his screen so you can see how the finding aid search works. Um, so another question, do you have to be at the archives to access these records or um, do you have to use family search? How can you access these records if you're not at the archives? There are a few different ways. Um, so the archives will do searches, uh, but you need to be very specific. Um, you need to say, this is the series, the title, this is the box, uh, this is the date. Uh, so you have to have you know, something that you know can be found by the state archive. So they, they will go do some searches, uh, especially for, for uh, um, the prison uh, records. Uh, they, uh, those have been digitized uh, for the most part on Ancestry, uh, but there may be something else in the state archives records that you want to find out. You, you need to be very specific. And, and that's actually described in the book, what kinds of things you need to tell the archives to do a search. Um, I, I mentioned the, the uh, digitization. So the state archives website, Ancestry and Family Search. Um, so th those would be, and then interlibrary loan. Um, if you see that a uh, series has been filmed, it may be available through interlibrary loan. And that you have to go to your local library. They're not loaned to individuals. Um, you have to go to your local library and work it, work it out through your local library. Um, one series in particular, I did not mention, local records on film. Uh, so the state archives in the starting in the 1970s through the 1990s, uh, uh, given grants to go out and digitize local, municipal, and county records. Um, so do a search on a particular community that you're researching in the finding aid, and you're uh, possibly and will come up with one of these uh, records on film. And, and I'll add to that, and if after looking at the website and doing some searches and, and looking around, 
you still don't know, contact the State Archives Monday through Friday, 9.30 in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There's somebody behind our email box, A-R-C-H-R-E-F at N-Y-S-E-D dot, dot gov, um, or give us a call. The phone number and the email is all on the website, but uh, never hesitate to reach out to somebody here. And I did also just put the link to the to the digital collections um, of the archives also in the chat box if anybody wants to see what's digitized. And um, Tom, do you know approximately what portion of the archives records are digitized at this point? I know you're always working hard to get more digitized. Right. Well, if you count Ancestry and Family Search, that's a lot of the genealogical resources, and um, I'd say a fairly significant portion, we'll say 10% of those geneal genealogically focused records. Um, it, it won't include things like the comptroller's accounts, because they're really sort of horses of a, of a different color. But the State Archives has over 30 miles of records. We have digitized maybe a uh, a couple of football fields worth. Um, so uh, a, a, not a significant, uh, when you look at the totality of the collection, but for genealogical purposes, a lot of those records have been digitized. I'll call a, a little bit of attention to, back to the finding aid search that Jane mentioned. That's where you can, in many cases, get that box and folder level. Now, I see that you have records of this particular uh, agency about this particular function. Box five has uh, the records for W to Z. And I'm looking to see if there's a document for my ancestry or, you know, Joe Washburn or something. Uh, we can look. Uh, but that you can get some of that detail from the finding aids. In addition, there's something called the name index, which has a lot of those prison records, et cetera. The records aren't digitized, but at least the access tool is available to help you hone down your research and ask somebody. So um, long-winded answer to your question. Not, every, not a lot is digitized, but a lot is. Um, and uh, a lot is available via those indexes. And, and I would like to add, add to that. Uh, so Ancestry, it's an all name index, you know, basically you, you put your, your person's name in. Uh, family search, not, uh, you need to browse uh, for the most part. I think maybe some of them uh, may have uh, name indexes, but in the tables in, in the book, you're going to see what series have some sort of index, but there are some series that there is no index at all, um, like the special bail pieces um, that I showed you. And so keep in mind that with those types of records, you're going to have to search and dig. Um, so it's not going to be an easy search. Um, and so just just be prepared that you know some of these series that are featured in the book, um, it's it's not easy to find a person in the records. But the journey to find that person is really a lot of fun. <laughs> it is. Okay, so we I'm gonna we have a lot of questions about the book itself. Um, and I'm just going to remind everyone the book is called New York State Archives, a guide for family historians, biographers, and historical research. And um, I know that you're working hard on, um, on, on getting it out there. And I'm going to put a link in right now to um, a website that, you, that people can take a look at and it will be, it'll be updated as the, as the book becomes available. But it sounds like an exhaustive survey. Is it? Is it one volume? Is it two volumes? It it is one volume, uh, and uh, I, I can't tell you how many pages at, at this point. Uh, you know, it's uh, but it, it certainly was a labor of love for me. Um, you know, I'm I'm a document junkie, and I I just had a ball going through all of these uh, different documents records at the state archives. I think your enthusiasm is infectious. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any plans to make the book, book available digitally or is it yes. just you Yes, okay. and I do not know the details. Okay. Um, does it cover, are there any religious um, records included? So again, these are governmental records. Uh, so if a church incorporated, uh, there could be an incorporation record. Uh, in some of the, the state archives records. 
Um, and then in the 1930s, uh, during the Great Depression, uh, the WPA, Works Progress Administration, Administration. I think it is, yeah, um, sent out uh, inventory people, um, in, people to inventory certain records. County records were inventoried, municipal, uh, town, village, and city records were inventoried. Some churches were inventoried. And so the state archives has an inventory of these churches uh, that are part of the, the WPA project. And so there is a section, uh, it's the, the chapter is called Local Records. So there is a section that features uh, the, the churches uh, that were inventoried. Uh, but, but actual records of a church, no. I How think about that's a really great example, Jane, where the government did an inventory of records of someone else. So you don't, we, we, it's not about churches, it's about the government program to inventory some records somewhere. It just to get your, everyone's mind in the right place about what the state archives has. It's government actions, records of government activities. Sorry. Well, and along those lines, would there be any institutional records, um, any sort of asylum or medical records? How, how might those be accessed? Um, institutional, there's a whole chapter on institutional records. Um, records that are uh, available, open for research, um, poor, I, poor house as an institution. Um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on what else is in the chapter. Unfortunately for New York, uh, there is the uh, mental hygiene law uh, that was enacted that restricts uh, research in all of the state hospital records. The archives cannot even confirm a patient's name. The archives has the records. Um, they are not available for genealogy research. Um, and so um, the, the, actually the employee records are, yes, but the actual records that regard patients, no. And that's a state law, which overrides the federal law, the federal HIPAA law. Okay. And um, if you come to the state archives, are records available on demand or do things need to be ordered in advance? Both. Um, it's recommended that you order in advance. Make You need to make a reservation to use the uh, research room. Uh, you'll be assigned a table and uh, include in your reservation, which you can make by email or, or phone, um, let them know what you want to look at in advance uh, and give them like a week's notice um, before you come because they may have an electronic uh, uh, index uh, that's, that's not online um, that they can send you and, the, and they can say, can you be more precise? Can you tell us which box uh, that you're looking for? And then the box will be available. Uh, when you arrive. If you find something there on the day and, uh, and you, you know, something leads you to something else, yes, you can order records. Their uh, retrievals, I think, are 10, 30, and 2. Um, so they're two times during the day, and you can order records while you're there, too. Yeah, and I think a good rule of thumb is just to always be in communication with, with the archives reference team as much as possible. Um, they're very helpful. Uh, so I promise we'll wrap it up soon. I know we're almost five minutes over time, but we have so many questions. So I'm just going to do two more. Um, one is really specific, but I think it will help people think about how you can get unstuck. Um, if I can't find out the father's name of a man in a War of 1812 record, land tax record, or censuses for Martinsburg, Lowville, I think that's Lowville, right? Um, from 1800 to 1830, and the man died of cholera on a visit to Canada, what kind of record could give me the father's name? Oh, wow. Um, I, after talking for an hour, there, there's too much information for my, <laughs> for my brain to process. Um, I don't know what records were kept in Canada. Uh, that would be the first place I would go, uh, is to look for, a, a, you know, see what kind of I don't think governmental records on deaths were kept in Canada at that time, um, but I would go looking for maybe a church record, uh, maybe a, you know something that that would help me in Canada. Um, in, in the National Archives of Canada is a pretty extensive collection, and each of the provinces have uh, pretty well developed archival programs. Um, and then, in terms of governmental records at the state archives, 
none that I can think of would actually name a father. So you need to go to local records like churches, um, uh, depending on when the death was, possibly a newspaper. Um, so the non-governmental records may include, and then do the cluster research. In, in New York, you have to do cluster research. Um, so you need to be re researching all the other, other people that that person was associated with. Um, you know, maybe there's a sister and there's a record regarding his, his sister that actually names the father. Um, so you get it, get it through a roundabout way. Yeah, and I think that's just a great example of how when you have a few pieces of information, that gives you a lot of different entry points for trying to follow the trail. Um, okay, last question. Can you discuss the overlap between resources at the New York City Municipal Archives and the New York State Archives? Tom can correct me if I'm wrong. There is no overlap because the New York City government is its own entity and it has been keeping records since it was New Amsterdam. Uh, so all of those uh, city governmental records are at the New York Municipal Archives. And then for the state, uh, we start uh, actually with the, the Dutch colonial, not New Amsterdam, D New Netherland. Uh, those records start in, I think, 1638. One volume uh, is missing from when it started in 1624. So uh, starting with 1638, uh, the Dutch uh, uh, New, uh, New Netherland records are at the archives, then the British records, 1663, and then the state records start in 1775, uh, with the provincial records uh, starting in 1775, that, that period when New York had not uh, declared it, it, uh, itself a state yet. Um, I think your example of the Dutch is really perfectly illustrative, because the records of the New Amsterdam, the city, are held by the municipal archives, but the records of New Netherland, the colony, the state versus the city, are kept by the state archives. That's a perfect example, Jane. They, they fit together very, very well and to tell the complete story, but they don't overlap. Exactly. And that's an example. You need to check local records. Uh, you need to check the state level, colony level records. And then when we get the federal government, you need to check uh, federal records. So a, a, a bunch of different governmental layers um, for a typical uh, research. Well, thank you so much. I, this is so much information. And I just want to remind all of you who joined us today that this um, will be this has been recorded and you will be given access to the full recording of this um, in about two weeks time. You'll be you'll get an email with a link to the recording. Um, so if you want to, you know, go back over any piece of information that you might have missed, it'll be there for you. Um, and in the meantime, I want to say thank you so much to Jane and Tom for joining us today. And thank you to all of our attendees. If you're interested in learning more, please visit archives.nysed.gov and newyorkfamilyhistory.org. It's our privilege to make these events available to you and to keep New York State's history live. If you're interested in the content we create and would like to see some more of it, please contact us at aptrust at nyse.gov to receive a free past issue of New York Archives magazine. So once again, Jane and Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.